question. Well, the, uh, there is a, a scenario in which the Palestinians are handing over the keys to Israel and say, continue and occupy us. The only thing that we want is to uh, vote. Uh, and we are, we are dissolving the Palestinian uh, Authority. This is something that uh, some of the leaders on the Palestinian side are toying with and have done it for uh, four years now. And I believe that this is a, a real uh, threat. I mean, this is a real problem. There is no threat that there will be only one state, a bilateral, a binational uh, state, because uh, the Israeli uh, prime minister or the Israeli government will always be able to prevent such a situation. If, for example, the Palestinians are saying, okay, it's the end of the Palestinian Authority, take the keys, and let's become one state. In my view, the reaction of the, a, an Israeli prime minister who is not ready, who wants peace perhaps, like Netanyahu. I mean, it is not that Netanyahu doesn't want peace, but it doesn't mean much if he wants peace as, as long as he doesn't, is not ready to pay the price for peace. So if there is an Israeli prime minister who is not ready to pay the price of peace, he will withdraw unilaterally exactly like Sharon, because Sharon was the example. He was not ready to pay the price, did not distinguish between Hamas and, and Fatah, it was the same for him, and decided to take his, his uh, own decision and to withdraw unilaterally. Now, on the West Bank, you al already know where to withdraw to, because this is the fence or the wall. It is already there. So if there is a demographic problem and Netanyahu says, okay, in, in few months there is a majority of Palestinians, the whole world will say that a minority of Jews are occupying a, a majority of Palestinians, apartheid and whatever, I believe that this will be his solution. Uh, to go uh, unilaterally to, uh, to the fence, and this is a very bad solution. Again, better than the current situation, but still very bad. And you know, in, in the debates in Israel, and uh, as you were told, the Geneva Initiative is not just an initiative which was proposed and, and evaporated. We have offices in Ramallah and in Tel Aviv, and we have many, many meetings, uh, town hall meetings, meetings in the universities and others with different groups. In Israel, we meet with the different parties, including with Likud. Likud members, I, I had a meeting with about 40 Likud heads of branches uh, two weeks ago. And we talked very openly about Geneva, and many of them support uh, Geneva. And I told them, you know, it will not go on forever. And you, you understand it. At a certain point, demography will win, and then you will be the ones to withdraw unilaterally. And I will tell you, if you already withdraw, get something for it. Have an address, have an agreement, something more than what you have in Gaza. You have nothing in Gaza. Not anybody to blame for what, uh, for what is happening there. And what I see is that there is a, I would say, sympathy to this uh, argument. So I don't think that the issue of a binational state is realistic. Not that the Palestinians want it, not that, that we want it, and even the right will not enable it. The, the real question right now is whether there would be a unilateral withdrawal, more or less, as Sharon and his people uh, planned about, uh, what, six years ago. Thank you. We have, a, I think, time for one or two more. Uh, Art, Art Hughes? Yeah. Hi, Art Hughes, MEI. You know, one of the proverbs is loosely translated as, without vision, the people are lost. There's a lot of talk about paying the price. They're willing to pay the price, willing to pay the price. Well, how about vision and say, well, what would the price be if you're not willing to do it now? This gets to what you just were saying, Yossi. The president says this is an un unsustainable situation, but the U.S. government has never made any attempt whatever to explain why, in fact, it's unsustainable to try to start building some sort of under, broader understanding. I know that's kind of a narrow point because the people on the Hill who vote the way they do, do it for very specific local reasons, so to speak. But again, if the price isn't paid now, it's gonna be a hell of a lot more difficult later on and I think there ought to be more focus on that aspect of it. Thank you. I guess that wasn't a question, was it? No. <laughs> a point well taken. Is that David Mikovsky I see? 
Thank you for the panel. Dave Makovsky, Washington Institute. A, a question to my friend Samich. Um, I get this when I travel across the United States, trying to talk about the importance of a two-state solution. One of the first questions I get, it goes like this. The Palestinians could not say yes to Ehud Olmert. Aren't you wasting your time, David? And uh, sometimes you'll hear or Mazen say, well, two and a half months after Olmert put his map down, the last day George Bush was in office, or a week before, we said, come to Washington, and the Israelis was in the middle of the cast-led operation. But what's missing is a very persuasive idea about why the Palestinians haven't said yes to Olmert, and that Abu Mazen now speaks warmly of Olmert. At the beginning, he said, well, there were still gaps. But if, if you speak so warmly that we could have had the deal right then, why not say yes to Olmert today? And then maybe start a dynamic that way that you're, there's now something very concrete on the table. And I think you, do, you, don't, you, you don't, but when I go around the country, I really hear this all the time. People wanting to go against the two state people saying, if you say no to Olmert, you're just wasting your time. So if you could respond to that and if you could say yes to Olmert today. Well, we hear this in after Camp David as well. You know, people were telling us you lost the offer, the uh, offer that was given to you from Barack. And I have a witness here. I am sure he can, and he did uh, uh, speak about it before. We did not have an offer. It was not no offer. And the reason for that, you can see that the only offer that we have was the Clinton parameter, which was five months after Camp David. So. And the same thing goes to Olmert. Olmert, there were a, a, a depth discussion between the two leaders. And really, it was moving forward toward that, but did not get to the point that they would say yes or no for this. Still, they were discussing all the issues in a type of a framework. They did not go into details for this. Yes, they present their map to us, Olmert map, but we present our map as well. And why, oh, we will say the same question to you, why you did not accept our offer? In Camp David, we, came, we came, gave an offer. With Annapolis, we also gave an offer. In Geneva, we gave an offer. Why the Israelis are not responding to our offers? Why is always that we have to respond to their offer? Their offer so far is not acceptable. Because when we hear what Netanyahu is saying that he will control one third of the West Bank when he mentioned the Jordan Valley. It's one third. You know, you draw the map yourself, uh, David. You know that one third is empty, that he wants to, to have uh, full control of that. The two thirds of the West Bank, he needs Jerusalem out of it, and he needs the blocks of settlements out of that. What is left for us? What is left for us? You see? Then that's why we are talking about a detailed map in more precise that we have to go after the framework, and what, this is exactly what Abu Mazen is, is, is asking for, just uh, agreeing of what Mr. Obama said in his speech on May 19th. We'll take that. We will take what is written in the uh, uh, quartet statement. We will accept that immediately, and let us start go and do details for those issues. That's why we, it's not a matter of accepting or not accepting Olmert. Yes, that was very positive discussion between Olmert and Abu Mazin. But the two leaders did not get to, to say yes or no for that. Was Olmert ready to, take, to say yes for what he proposed? He had to go to the Knesset first in order to get yes or no, right? And Abu Mazin had to go to his people as well to ask him whether he can say yes or no. So it's not a matter of really who offers what? We all the time put an offer on the table. Let's for one time discuss our offer at least. We are under occupation, and we are giving part of uh, 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 our demands. It is part of the West Bank that we are giving. It's not part of Israel that we're taking. You see, that's uh, 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 the whole issue, that for us is giving Jerusalem, part of Jerusalem, part of the West Bank, part of the Jordan Valley, uh, uh, security issues and all that, we are the ones who are giving. Why don't you accept our offer for that? Omar wanted to internationalize Jerusalem. I think, I think we, we, we should also end, we should also end. Uh, one, one, uh, word. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, I would say, if I may, uh, kind of scientifically, the only point 
where there was an offer put on the table and the two parties were asked to refer to it was on December 2000, when the Clinton parameters were put on the table. We took a decision in a very, very complicated meeting of the cabinet uh, to accept the Clinton parameters and we had some reservations. The decision was that this resolution of us will be valid only if the Palestinians, if Arafat says yes. Then the, the, there was a time limit that Clinton gave to both uh, uh, sides until, until Wednesday, something like this. Wednesday passed, no Palestinian reaction, and then Arafat came to uh, Washington. It was January the, the second or the <coughs> first even. And he met with, with Clinton twice, in the morning and in the afternoon. And the answer that Arafat gave to Clinton was not no, but very far from yes. And as time passed, it was perceived by the president himself, especially when he left the, his, uh, the function, as a kind of a negative reaction to the Clinton parameters. I don't know whether it was not too late in December 2000. Maybe it was too late. I remember then when we talked in Taba uh, in, uh, in January 2001, and we referred to the Clinton uh, parameters as the basis for our talks in Taba, it was Abu Allah, the head of the delegation on the Palestinian said, side, who said, but we, we never accepted it. So, and we did not reject it too. So let us not refer to it as a basis. And if retroactively, I may see what was the mistake, the Palestinian mistake, I agree with Samir 100%. The in, King, in Camp David and by, by Olmert, it was not a very clear cut uh, offer that the Palestinians had to say yes or no. In the Clinton parameters, it was a clear cut and regretfully, there was no positive answer to it. And perhaps many things could have been different had it been a positive answer then. Well, um, Jack Kennedy once described himself as an idealist without illusion. I think, frankly, that's the best sort of um, prescription to adopt for the period ahead. Um, with courageous and committed Israeli and Palestinian leaders and um, effective American mediation, there's no reason why the Israeli-Palestinian conflict cannot be resolved. Putting those things together, however, uh, will be very hard. Giving up would be worse. So please join me in thanking our two panelists. Thank you very much. Now the next panel will resume almost immediately. Thank you very much.